Today, we are going to take some time to study God's Word together with the sermon titled, The Hope of Mankind. Currently, all mankind is in a grave situation, suffering from a disease that is caused by a deadly virus. This is in addition to many natural disasters that have been occurring as well. Even this past summer, in Korea, there has been a great amount of damage caused by typhoons and floods. It seems as though this year there were significantly more natural disasters than previous years. In America, over 10,000 lightning strikes ignited large fires on the mountains across California. It has been nearly impossible to put out the fires, even though countless firefighters have been sent from across the country. It has been reported that the fires may not be under control until it snows this year. On top of this, hurricanes stronger than ever before have hit the East Coast. Since many natural disasters and diseases are occurring continuously, the economy has been severely affected. Those who work to gain daily wages are worried about putting food on the table since they are not able to work. All of these problems have become a catalyst and have even led to riots. Seeing the news of the world, we cannot help but think that the future of mankind is bleak. It was also broadcast throughout mass media. The cell of the coronavirus withstood being pierced by a microscopic needle up to 100 times. This is the same as if a person were to be struck with a spear 100 times, yet still be alive without any injuries. They even tried heating the coronavirus to over 90 degrees Celsius, but the virus was not affected at all. People wonder, can humans completely get rid of COVID-19? This kind of tragic news can be heard more and more each day. They say that climate change is getting worse too. This year, in Korea, I can clearly remember that it rained continuously for two months. It has been reported that this was caused by global warming. The glaciers in the Arctic are melting at a tremendous speed, and permanent snow on the mountains is melting, so it is more scarce around the world. It has been reported that the Earth is losing its regulatory function that controls the temperature. Therefore, the future of this Earth is uncertain. This is the reality of the situation we are living in now. However, don't we have God the Father and God the Mother, who are the hope of mankind? What if we didn't have God the Father and God the Mother in our lives? What kind of lives would we be living now? Let us not live only for earthly things that are temporary and then disappear. But think once again what great glory and joy it is to live while serving father and mother in Zion. Let us march more energetically toward the things of the everlasting kingdom of heaven. Let us take a look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Who was the hope of mankind in the age of the Father? It was God, Jehovah. In the age of the Son, the hope of mankind was Jesus Christ. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, whose hearts are deeply wounded, and who are yoked. Like this, God came to this earth in the age of the Son and became the hope for mankind. He said, Whoever is in anguish, come to me. Then who is the hope of mankind in this age of the Holy Spirit, which we are living in? 
Let's go to Revelation, chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, What do they say? Come. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And in Revelation chapter 22, what did the Spirit and the Bride say? They said, Come to us. Come to us, all you who are thirsty and are suffering from heavy burdens. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. In this age of the Holy Spirit, we must put our hope only in the Spirit and the Bride. The things of this earth disappear after a short time. Even if someone has millions of dollars, regardless of how much money they have, their glory doesn't even last 100 or 200 years. It is all temporary. After a little while, they simply pass it down to their descendants once they get old. However, because it is not something they acquired through their own hard work and efforts, the descendants easily lose it and it becomes someone else's. Nothing on this earth lasts forever. Therefore, in order to give hope to mankind, God said, with the name of Jehovah in the age of the Father, and with the name of Jesus in the age of the Son, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And in this age of the Holy Spirit, God is calling mankind, saying, Come to the Spirit and the Bride. If we have hope for the kingdom of heaven, let us not cling to the things of this earth, but set our hearts on the things of heaven. Today, am I living a life that deserves a return to heaven? Am I walking the right path of faith? We should reflect upon ourselves having these kinds of thoughts. We must have faith that leads us to the salvation of our soul in this age. In order to go to the Spirit and the Bride, we need to know who the Spirit and the Bride are. Where are they? What is the sign they have brought to this earth while dwelling among us? We must know all the answers to these questions. Let's move on to Psalms chapter 132, verse 13. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for His dwelling. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor will I satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints will ever sing for joy. Zion is the place God has chosen. God chose Zion to make it His dwelling place forever and ever. Thus, since God said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, whoever is thirsty, come. Shouldn't we go to the place where God dwells? God said, Come. In order to find God, who is the hope of mankind, we must go to where God is. We cannot meet God through a vague theory or idea that only comes from our mind. Rather, we must return to the place God appointed through the prophecies. We should be the people who can discern whether or not we are in a prophetical place or just an ordinary building. Two thousand years ago, Jesus entered Jerusalem, riding on a colt. This was prophesied in Zechariah chapter 9. Those who were in front of and behind Jesus shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of David. They praised Jesus and spread their cloaks on the road for him. Many people praised him. However, those present didn't realize that the donkey that Jesus was riding on had already been prophesied about. They were oblivious to the fact that the work Jesus was doing was to fulfill a part of a prophecy.
They didn't understand, nor realize they were in this prophesied place. Today, we are meeting God, who is the hope of mankind. Nevertheless, there are people who are wasting their time, not realizing how awesome meeting God truly is. What does the Bible tell us about the place where God, the hope of mankind, dwells? The Bible says that it is Zion. Zion is His dwelling place forever. If we want to meet God, we must go to Zion and seek God there. In order to meet God, who is the future and hope of all mankind, the place we must go to is Zion. Let us look at Isaiah chapter 33. Chapter 33, verse 20. Look upon Zion, the city of our festivals. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a peaceful abode, a tent that will not be moved. What is the city of our festivals called? Prophetically, it is Zion, the church that keeps God's feasts, the place where the feasts are celebrated, and where people who keep the feast are gathered is Zion. At this moment, we are all gathered together in this prophesied place where God dwells. You've all come to this place in order to find and meet God, who is the hope of mankind. Isn't that true? God said He would be with us in Zion forever. And we are in Zion, where God is with us. Let us continue with verse 21. There. What place does there refer to? Zion. The Lord will be our mighty one. It will be like a place of broad rivers and streams. No galley with oars will ride them. No mighty ship will sail them. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. It is He who will save us. Your rigging hangs loose. The mast is not held secure. The sail is not spread. Then an abundance of spoils will be divided, and even the lame will carry off plunder. No one living in Zion will say, I am ill. And the sins of those who dwell there, those who dwell in Zion, will be forgiven. They will all receive the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, all mankind must put their hope only in God. Our lives are short and quickly pass by. It seems like yesterday we were in our 20s, but now we are in our 30s. It seemed like yesterday we were in our 30s, but now we are in our 40s. It seems like yesterday we were in our 40s, but now we are in our 50s, 60s, and 70s. Our lives pass by in a moment. Everything passes so quickly. This is the reality of our lives. People are like the boy from the fairy tale who chased rainbows every day to catch one. The boy would say, the rainbow's over that mountain, so I just need to reach the mountain to find it. So he would run, but then the rainbow was over the ocean. He would then say to himself, I just need to go to the ocean to catch the rainbow. He ran toward the rainbow all his life, but he was never able to catch it. Didn't God already say in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1, that we could not catch it? It is written meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. We must put our hope in the everlasting kingdom of heaven. Isn't this why God prepared the everlasting world for us, where we don't age, and there's no more death or pain or anguish or sorrow? We must put our hope in heaven. But sometimes we waver and put our hope in this earth. We easily fall into anguish and suffering. Everyone, we must not only chase the things of this earth because they are visible to our eyes. Consider the rainbow that we can see but cannot catch. This is why God had the author of the book of Ecclesiastes write as follows. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever.
From this point on, mankind must turn their hope to God, who truly exists and whom we can meet. We must not fix our eyes on our physical lives alone, but on the eternal kingdom of heaven. We need to fully realize and look to God, who has come to this earth to forgive our sins. It is imperative that we find Him and meet Him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. God told us to come to Him 2,000 years ago. And isn't He saying the same thing in the age of the Holy Spirit? Come and find me. However, many people do not put their hope in God, but in worldly things, such as fame, romantic relationships with the opposite gender, or materialistic things. Many people waste their time chasing vain things, like the boy chasing the rainbow. When Solomon reflected back on his life, he said, Meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I've had many concubines, much wealth, abundant knowledge, and great fame. But in the end, they are all meaningless. He emphasized that people who fear God and keep His commands are living their lives correctly. This is why we should meet the Spirit who is our Heavenly Father and the Bride who is our Heavenly Mother in Zion, who are the hope of mankind. Let us also fear Heavenly Father and Mother and go to the Kingdom of Heaven following their guidance. Why do we need to do this? God said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and left a prophetical example for us. Let us go to Matthew chapter 9. In chapter 9, verse 1, it is written, Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic, lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth, what kind of authority does he have? To forgive sins. Jesus wanted to let them know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. That is why he said, your sins are forgiven. Although it would have been easier to say, this disease is driven out of you, he said, your sins are forgiven. Why are we living on this earth? Isn't it because of our sins that we've been cast down to earth and have to live this physical life? Then, who is the only one who can take away our sins and give us the forgiveness of sins? It is only God. God is the hope of all mankind. We are not living on this earth to only make money, to enjoy fame, or to gain greater knowledge than others. Even if someone has amassed all the knowledge on this earth, it cannot be compared with that of heaven. That is why Solomon said, Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Although he had great wisdom, wealth, authority, and fame, it means that ultimately they are nothing. However, people born on this earth are still walking that path, chasing after things because they do not realize they are meaningless. Everyone, we have come to God, the hope of mankind, by responding to His call. We must be proud of the fact that we have come to God and dwell in Zion. We are living the most righteous, highest standard of life among all mankind. Our goal is to live in heaven. If our life on this earth finishes, 
It doesn't mean our overall life is over. God meant, please understand that although I am in the flesh and am known by people as a carpenter's son, I am the one who has authority to forgive your sins. The same story is written in the Gospel of Luke as well. Let us turn to it. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? or to say, get up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Brothers and sisters, nowadays people regard Jesus as someone very extraordinary. However, in those days, He wasn't treated any differently than other people. He was in the flesh and in the same situation as everybody else. People of that time asked, isn't his father a carpenter? And isn't his mother Mary? All his brothers are here with us. In that age, this is how he was commonly perceived. Nowadays, people know who Jesus really is in nature. That is why they serve him. They understand that he is God, who came to the earth in the age of the sun. However, he was only an ordinary person in the eyes of the people of that time. In their eyes, he was relegated to nothing more than that. However, what kind of authority did he come with? I want to let you know that I have authority to forgive the sins of mankind. That is why Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, although it is easier to say, get up and walk. It was because he wanted to let them know he had the authority to forgive sins. What do you think is the most joyful news for sinners who sinned in heaven and were expelled to earth? God, who forgives sins, is the hope of mankind. He is here with us in Zion. God has come to the earth with the authority to forgive sins and the authority to bless us with eternal life. We ought to tell all people, come to Zion, the Church of God, where the Spirit and the Bride dwell, and where the Feast of God are celebrated. Two thousand years ago, when people regarded Jesus as a mere man, the apostles went out and boldly testified, Believe in the Lord Jesus, then you and your household will be saved. Nowadays, people confidently say this because there are many people who believe in Jesus. However, back then, they were branded as the Nazarene sect when they said that. We are now in the same situation. Our church is a church God established, and we serve God. This church was prophesied about, and through this church, prophecies are being fulfilled at every moment. However, people simply think they're holding some kind of worship and gathering in an ordinary building, nothing special at all. God is with us and gives us the forgiveness of sins. Where else on earth have people ever received this blessing? Those to whom Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, are the most blessed people on earth. Everyone, the hope of mankind is in our God. Our hope is not in the vaccine that can eliminate COVID-19, not on a doctor, not on a nation's policy, not on a king 
or on any politician. Our God is our only hope. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. The Spirit and the Bride said, Everybody come. They said, Just come. It is because the hope of mankind is God. Those who know the truth understand that their future can be bright and glorious by living according to the words of the Bible. Although people around us are not following this path, since they have yet to find it, we, who have found the path of righteousness, must live according to God's word. We have God, who is the hope of mankind. Shouldn't we boast about this? Let's boast about this a lot. Whoever wants to receive the forgiveness of sins, salvation, and go to heaven, must come to Zion, where God dwells. Let us be the ones that boldly preach like this. Isn't our church where the Spirit and the Bride, who are the hope of mankind, dwell? Let us boldly testify about the Holy Spirit, Father An sang and New Jerusalem Heavenly Mother, and confidently proclaim to all people to come to Zion, where they dwell. I hope we will be able to save all mankind by preaching in Samaria and to the ends of the earth with the power of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. This concludes today's sermon. Thank you very much.